Good evening and welcome to the April 26th regular meeting of the Newtown Township Board of Supervisors. Uh, glad to be here this evening. I hope you are too. And uh, why don't we start with a moment of silence as, a, as customary. Uh, give ourselves a chance to uh, get our breath. Thank you very much. Uh, please join the board in uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Uh, Mr. Lewis, are there any changes to the agenda this evening? No changes, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, no special actions. Uh, we do have a, a guest with us tonight to present the DVRPC uh, LED Streetlight Procurement Program. Uh, Mr. Lewis, would you like to introduce our speaker? Good evening, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, we have Mike from Keystone Lighting. Uh, solutions here to give a presentation on uh, the LED street light conversion uh, program. Thank you. Mike, would you mind turning on your microphone? There it goes. Okay, great. Great. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm here to talk to you about the uh, Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission Regional Street Light Procurement Program. It's a lighting street light upgrading program that many municipalities have participated in uh, over the last five years. And we've been working with you uh, to put together a feasibility study so you could see the opportunity associated with that and decide if you want to move on to uh, phase two, which is the design phase of the program. Mm -hmm. So we can go on to the, uh, uh, the next slide and the next slide. Great. So just very briefly, the reason most municipalities pursue LED lighting upgrades are uh, for the, uh, first of all, the financial benefits. There's significant operating cost savings, both in energy and maintenance savings, uh, that help pay for the project. Um, unlike many other projects that you have to do and expend money for, uh, the streetlight program is actually going to pay you back over time, or at least pay for itself uh, over time uh, through those operating cost savings. LEDs are also much more controllable, and so we can do things like keep light from going up into the sky, which is important for dark sky considerations. Uh, and it basically allows us to get the light where it needs to be onto the roadways and uh, sidewalks for uh, safe uh, for safety purposes. So we can go on to the next slide. The reason that DVRPC developed this program is they thought many municipalities could benefit by coming together, pulling their resources, and leveraging the scale of uh, procurement, really, of LED street lighting projects. And so DVRPC put together this turnkey project that provides all the uh, uh, technical assistance that you need to develop such a project, uh, gives you all the design capability, and also does that procurement. So they've gone out and they've actually procured all the materials, all the professional services that you need, all the installation services, and, and is doing that for the entire program. So is doing that at a very large scale and delivering costs that are much below market level than if you were to go alone and try to do this project uh, on your own. So this is, uh, you're considering being in the fourth round of the project. So the first three rounds have touched over 70 municipalities uh, in all of the collar counties around Philadelphia. Uh, Bucks County has been very active. Many of your neighbors uh, have already done these upgrades in previous rounds. And uh, uh, in touching those 70 municipalities, we've upgraded over 30,000 uh, street lights, and we've also reduced a great deal of energy consumption for those municipalities and therefore have reduced uh, carbon emissions through uh, significant energy conservation also. So it has a very sustainable uh, side to the project also. We can go on to the next slide. Basically, we have four phases of the project. Uh, you're in the feasibility phase, which is a data-driven phase, which means we haven't done any audits of your street lighting system. We're just using data that's available to us that you assisted us with and we also took off of your uh, PICO bills 
is a primary data source. And this is a free phase for you. DVRPC actually pays for this feasibility study that I've developed um, uh, for you. And that leads you to uh, the action that you can consider taking tonight is do you want to move on to the design phase? And that's where we do the real work of we do a, a full GIS-based audit. I use all that information to actually um, uh, design your project. And then uh, at the end of that phase, we, we bring you a detailed project specification uh, that shows you exactly what the project is. And then you can decide if you want to move on to construction. I will point out that when we go through the de design phase, the, the pricing is firm. It's set. It's already been pre-negotiated by, not pre-negotiated, pre-procured uh, uh, by DVRPC. So they have contracts with uh, the installer, the manufacturers, and that pricing will not change. If you were to do this project on your own, you'd have certain procurement requirements. In this case, you're able to piggyback off of what DVRPC did via Chapter 19 of the Pennsylvania Procurement Act, so you don't have to do any of that procurement. They've already done it, and you're just uh, piggybacking off of that. So um, when we come to you at the end of uh, Phase 2 design, you're essentially getting a firm project quote, because we will know from the audit exactly how many light fixtures that you have, and we'll have firm pricing associated with everything. So it's not like you're bidding out a 95% complete job. It's a it's a firm price at that point. So we can go into the next slide. The uh, We did deliver a, a much larger feasibility study. I'm just summarizing it for you here in these slides uh, today. Uh, we can go on to the next slide. So the next two slides just show you what's in the scope of the project. So uh, the first uh, street light type, uh, luminaire type that you have is a traditional cobra head fixture. You can see uh, what that looks like. And that's on some of your main road areas. And you have 152 of those. Uh, in the project, we would be taking off that old head, putting on a new LED fixture head, and the arm and the wiring would stay. We carry contingency in case there's bad wiring. Uh, that does occur occasionally, but we have money set aside to handle that um, in all of the project costs that we're showing you. We can go into the next slide. This is really where the bulk of your project is. You have a lot of decorative fixtures. We call these four-sided colonial fixtures in all of your residential areas. Uh, as you can see, you have almost 1,300 of those. And we, again, would basically take off uh, the head. And you actually have two versions of it, which I'm showing there on the right. We would take off that head, put on the new uh, LED head, and uh, basically the arm would stay. We don't change the pole or anything like that. Um, so it's, this is really a one-for-one one fixture replacement is what the project is. Uh, we certainly, in phase two, if there's some custom areas where you feel you need a little more light or you have a dark area, we can add fixtures also. But primarily, most of the projects are one-for-one one, uh, replacement projects. We can go on to the next slide. I won't touch on this too much now other than when we get into phase two, we'll talk a lot about controls. Uh, LEDs are controllable unlike the older technology. So we have the ability to connect uh, or to, to put controls on them that we can adjust light levels if necessary. There's some very low cost uh, methods of controlling those lights. We call those manual controls, which basically it's a little dimmer switch inside the fixture. We don't suggest that you customize lighting across the township, but it is there and available for you if sometime in the future you need to increase or decrease light levels at a particular location. That's what we call manual uh, dimming controls. But you can also, you are one of the larger municipalities in this round. Um, it, uh, some municipalities choose to do a network lighting control system where every light fixture is connected to a network. And then that network you can access through a cloud-based uh, uh, software system that you can then control all your lights. You can manage all your lights. But I'll tell you the primary reason larger municipalities do it is for maintenance purposes. So they can get outage reports proactively the day they occur. If a, if a light pole gets knocked down, we get a tilt uh, fault on that. If it's burning during the day, which it shouldn't, we get a report on that. So again, in uh, phase two, the design phase, we'll talk a lot more about controls. But we've priced them out for you in the feasibility study, just so you get a sense of the, the costs associated with those types of options. We can go into the next slide. Uh, so talking about the, the financials, this is just a summary. And again, there's more detailed charts in the feasibility study that show you uh, all the costs. 
are really, the first two options are essentially the same because the way we optimize rebates for you, because there are PICO rebates, um, we actually do put manual controls into our base upgrade. Um, so I'll just talk about the first item there, the base upgrade. You can see that the annual operating cost, you would reduce your operating uh, cost energy and maintenance wise by $43,000 a year is the feasibility study estimate. That would cost about $700,000 after you receive the uh, rebate. So that's net of the rebate. Um, and so uh, that would be a payback period of uh, 16 years. Um, we do have uh, quicker payback projects, but your mix of decoratives is somewhat unique. Most uh, municipalities have a lot of cobra heads and they're a little uh, cheaper, but this is still a very attractive, you know, within that 20 year period, uh, it's gonna pay for itself um, through those operating cost savings. And then the last column we showed there is over that 20 years after you've paid for everything, you're gonna generate a net of $172,000 in net savings. So that's money that could be spent on other uh, township uh, needs. Uh, then I'll just go to the bottom solution. That's the network control uh, option. You can see that the energy savings are a little bit better because you can go to a different PICO tariff, which it costs you or saves you some additional uh, money, but it does cost more. So now we're talking about a million dollar project. Um, that's again, after the rebates have been paid from PICO. And uh, now you're getting closer to a 19 year uh, payback on that. All of this can shift and be, you know, fine tuned in the design phase, but at the feasibility phase with the data we have, this is uh, a, a good solid estimate of the opportunity uh, that's there for you. So we can go on to the next slide and the final slide. Uh, so of course I can take any questions on the feasibility study and the, the scope of the upgrades, um, but your next step would be to decide if you wanna to go to the design phase. Again, you're not approving a project or anything like that. You're just deciding if you wanna to go to the design phase. Uh, you can see in red there in the middle of the slide that the, the cost of doing the audit, the design, the project specifications, all of that, uh, primarily the audit is the big cost in it. Uh, that's uh, $37,000 is what you'd be committing to to go into the design phase. And then again, at the end of that, you'd have a firm specified project that you could decide if you want to go forward with construction. Uh, the timing for uh, kickoff of phase two, the design phase would be essentially uh, probably mid-May, we're gonna have auditors come in and start auditing. And this is a GIS based audit where they capture every single location uh, with GPS coordinates and they capture about 30 to 40 attributes about every light fixture and then we use that for design. Even if you don't go forward to construction, all that data would be turned over to you and could be used in your GIS system. So there's, there's a great deal of value just in all that data of, of uh, knowing your streetlight system. Our goal would be to finish the design phase and be back uh, to those municipalities that go through uh, the design phase, probably towards the end of the summer to see if you wanna go forward with the project. And then uh, construction would either start at the end of this year or beginning of next year uh, where, you know, some townships like to wait till right till the beginning of the year to start it and that's, we could do that. Um, but we'll, we'll finish everything up by the, the end of the first quarter of 2024. So that's what I have for you today. I went through it pretty quick. Obviously you were given a lot more information than were in these summary slides, but uh, available to answer any questions for you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for providing two PowerPoints and and the uh, actual feasibility study of 20, 36, 37 pages, I think. So we did go through them all. Um, and I thought what we would do is have some questions from the board and see if we have a motion uh, and we'll get some public comment then as well. Okay. Um, I, I have three or four questions. Um, so this is going from phase one which is feasibility to design, which is phase two. Um, and it also looks like it, it will take a good three months if, if we decide to go on to construction at that point. Um, it looks like it, it's a good three months, 70, 71 work days or whatever. Yeah. Um, so what, I, I guess the question I have is what happens when you come back to us with phase two uh, results, the data and everything. 
Yeah, at the end of phase two, you're going to get a document that is very similar looking to the feasibility study and another presentation similar, almost okay. exactly the same format, but everything will be firmed up. We will have done the audit and we'll know exactly how many uh, street lights you have of which types. And usually we find a few more or a few less. The PICO numbers are never exactly correct. Mm -hmm. They're pretty good, but yeah. And, and we also will talk to you if there's any other uh, special needs that you have that you want us to address in the project, we would integrate those into the final okay. project specification. And um, yeah, so basically you'd get another deliverable very similar to what you got this time around. And <clears throat> it will probably be, probably be pretty close to the uh, 699 that you're, six, $699,000 that you're, um, Projecting as a cost. Yeah, all the firm pricing that I mentioned you'd see in phase two are actually integrated into the feasibility study too. The only thing that really changes the number is if we find more street lights. Okay. So at a unit cost basis, it would be the same firm unit prices. Just a couple more. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was a little bit disappointed with the 16-year payback. I was hoping for more like 10 or 12. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, um, let me let me ask you about the the maintenance during that time. How how much? What would be the difference? I guess because we're paying maintenance now uh, to maintain our lights, uh, and how does that compare to what the the maintenance for LED lights? And how how long does an LED light, you yep. know, last? Yeah, I'll answer that a couple ways. In the financials, we do assume some maintenance savings. We're very conservative in that. Uh, the chart that I showed, there's actually a more detailed version of that where I break out the mm -hmm. operating costs into the energy cost savings and the maintenance savings. Um, but, but you'll see the majority of the cost savings are in the energy side. Yes. Uh, so, uh, but probably a better way to answer the question is if you, if you were to buy the older style fixture that you have installed now, you basically get a one-year warranty on that fixture um, if you were to just buy it from a supply house. Uh, all the LED product, this is a reflection of what, of what they think the life is, the manufacturers. They give a 10-year warranty, and that doesn't mean that they think the useful life is 10 years. When they give a 10-year warranty, there's, they have to have 2x, 3x that life to, uh, to have that warranty be set at 10 years. If they thought they were only getting 15 years, they'd lose a lot of money by having a 10-year warranty. So uh, the manufacturer data says that that LED fixture has a 40-year life. I don't like to quote that. I say that comfortably you've got a 20 to 30-year uh, lighting fixture um, that, that you're going to uh, be installing. But uh, you also get a one-year labor and product warranty from the installer. So for that, when LEDs yeah. fail, they tend to fail quickly. And so usually it's even when, and it's a very, very low percentage, but it's usually when the contractor may still be on site, uh, maybe on the day they install it and they just take it out and ship it back, get, get a new one in, and there's no, no cost associated with that. So for one year, we just call the contractor. He takes care of everything. But you do have that 10-year product warranty that right. parallels that and then goes beyond. At least in norm normal, <clears throat> normal circumstances, then the... The life of the LED light is past the payback period. Yes, in normal, absolutely. Normal situations. We we choose a twenty year time frame to do all of our financials for all of our projects because we know that that life, you know, that there's savings beyond that point. Mm -hmm. um, you know, probably in that twenty to thirty year, you're going to get those same annual savings uh, without having to replace uh, the fixture. Of course, there's always small percentages of of uh, failures, but hopefully they occur in the warranty period. So, after they're paid off, and you know, uh, you know, go to the bank and get a loan. But when, uh, after that loan's paid off, there would actually be a, a savings in our budget year to year after that. Yeah, absolutely. After that saves that same after annual after savings payback. that I show for the first twenty years continues on because you basically just have lowered your compared to the baseline right. of what you're paying now. Okay. You lowered your energy, energy costs. I think that catches most of my questions. I hope I didn't steal too many from other folks. But uh, I, I have some, some questions. 
Yes, so I, I like the idea of switching to LED lights. Mm -hmm. I think it's the way to go. Uh, I'm concerned with the, the amount that's going to cost. I know it's over a loan over 16 years and whatnot. But what, what, do we get, what advantage do we get from going with this program over just, say, replacing them ourselves one at a time over 16 years? Yeah, you're going to pay much, much less by doing it through our program compared to going on your own. Uh, some municipalities look at things like, oh, I'll try to use CoStars through the state of Pennsylvania. CoStars does not... You, can, you could technically buy these products through there, but there's no price that they've negotiated on your behalf okay. to do that. So what DVRPC did with a massive RFP that they put out to uh, procure all these costs really drove the prices down below uh, market levels. So that's one aspect. Um, I would also mention in phase, in the design phase, we can also talk to you about, um, you know, the possibility of, of uh, financing. So you could actually could have a lot of the, um, you could have a loan where uh, a lot of the loan payments would be paid with the savings. So your actual uh, annual outlay might be a lot less. We already did talk to, we use DelVal um, when we do those financing arrangements. You're a large enough project and you have a relationship with them, as I understand, talking to them, <coughs> that they would be happy to entertain talking to you about, uh, about financing it and We've been really successful using DelVal. So, but that's kind of a, a phase two discussion. Understood. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I guess I have a question for you, Mr. Lewis. Sorry to hit you. Um, how are we fixed for <coughs> budgetary call on this? Or would this be just like a vote on a purchase or on the signing of a loan to pay for this? Or how we work that into the budget? I'm so it would be worked into the budget under debt service. Um, so same thing we did with the road program a few years ago where we did that million dollar project. You take a loan out for say a million dollars and you finance it over X amount of time, two, three years, uh, and then you would need to support that with uh, tax revenue to pay for it. And that's something that we would do, we could do this year and not wait for the next budget. Is that what you're basically saying? Yes, it would yeah. be in next year's budget. It would be in next year's budget? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. So we... We'd be positioned just on that timing that you would get your construction proposal right about the time that you'd be putting your budgets together for, for next year. So you'd have a good firm price. Um, mm -hmm. And then if you approved the project, you know, we could hold till the, fin the budget was approved and financing possibly could be in place. Yeah. Can you tell us who else is involved in round two as far as municipalities right now? Or are we the first... Oh, no. Um, so we, we are now, we really think the program may end at about round five because most of the municipalities that are, <clears throat> are interested we've now hit. So we, we started with 35 in round one. <clears throat> we had, uh, I think it was uh, 26 in round two. Round three was only nine. Um, and this round that you're in, round four, there's currently five that are considering it. So uh, Two of the five have already approved, moving into the design phase. Um, you're the third. The other two are meetings that I have in the next coming uh, weeks. In terms of some of your neighbors, I was trying to go from memory, writing most of them down, but Newtown Borough, Ben Salem, Tullytown, Middletown, New Britain, Buckingham, Langhorne Manor, Ivyland, New Hope, Pendell are just the Bucks County uh, projects. I, there might be one or two there, more that I missed there. So. Um, but they were spread out over round one through round three. Yep. Anybody else? Questions? Yes. Go ahead. Yes, please, Mr. Collabo. Okay. Um, of those townships, which, uh, which would be most uh, compatible or comparable to ours? Middletown had a lot of four-sided colonials. Um, not quite the mix that you had, but I think they had over a 1,000... They might have had a couple thousand colonials, so Mid Middletown would probably be a good comparison. But they did have more cobra heads, so like they're, uh, yeah, it, that'd probably be the most similar. I mean, uh, Buckingham was a lot of colonials too, but they're much smaller, obviously. Okay. Um, what would what would in a roundabout number the total cost be to the township to go with this program? Eight hundred thousand, a million. How, how much? Yes. Yeah, so on the financial slide, um, I would say that the range, and it's po after you get the rebate, 
back. And let me just explain that. PICO gives you a rebate, and probably within about a month or two of the end of construction, you get a check from PICO to offset your project costs. Um, so that's why we show you the, the net savings, because usually it all happens within a month of, of the final billing um, that occurs. Uh, but right now we're estimating after the rebates are paid a range of 700000 for kind of a base upgrade up to uh, a little over a million dollars if you went with the sophisticated network control system. And, well, I just, uh, at, at 700000 if we were to have to <clears throat> increase the debt service tax, would we be increasing our taxes by at least two mils in that case? It depends on the term and the life of the loan, but it's something like that, yes. Okay. Um, but I do just want to point out, you will have operating cost savings in other parts of your budget offsetting a, okay. a large portion of the loan payments okay. if, if you did financing. Now, um, th does does PICO at all offer such a program to, to townships? I'm, I'm surprised that they don't because they, they're always <clears throat> looking to incentivize uh, savings. Yeah, they're highly supportive of our program. They're excited about us doing this, and we have a great relationship with them. And as a matter of fact, we do all of the updates to your bills with PICO, um, so we handle all that as part of the turnkey project as well as the PICO rebates. Okay. Now, now you're um, estimating, uh, I guess we will uh, break even after 15, 16 years? 16 years with like the base okay. upgrade. Now during the course of that period, have you factored in, I guess, increases in electricity costs? If we do not, which is conservative, if you would have increases in electricity costs, the, the payback would go down because your energy savings would be greater. Your project costs would not go up, so. I mean, I mean you're, are, are, you, are you trying to tell us that electricity costs will go down? No, we just like to take the conservative flat rate. Most people that do this type of work um, in other areas, not necessarily street lighting, they uh, they always bake in electricity cost increases, and it makes their projects look much more attractive than we try to be conservative. Okay. Now, uh, when, when uh, I, I, Mr. Fisher had asked something about uh, when these lights were to basically, I'll, I'll say, wear out. Mm -hmm. um, if, if they were to wear out in the 15th year before the 16th year that we get our break even, what would the cost be to replace these lights? Because then we're, we're looking into, is our return on investment going to be higher than the cost or the cost going to be higher than the return on investment? Yeah, we, we factor all that in in our uh, maintenance savings. So we actually assume a small percentage of failures that occur in the 20 years. Um, so that's baked into our, it reduces our maintenance savings that we calculate. So um, there's no hidden costs, future costs in years 15 through 20 that we're not factoring into our maintenance calculations. Well, I'm just, the reason I'm just uh, mm -hmm. asking to, to put it into a, a simpler thought here is I, I know uh, in my in my own home when a light bulb bl blows out, mm -hmm. they usually blow out bum 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 all at, all at the same time. <laughs> if this were to happen here, yeah, would this escalate our cost of of replacement? Uh, that's not typically how things fail. Um, you know, at the year fifteen, you might have a photo cell might fail, and you might replace that, or a driver, a component of that LED fixture may fail and you may replace that. But you're, you're going out to every one of your light fixtures on average, I'd say once every two to four years, let's say three years, you're going out and paying right now to change out components in those 30, 40 year old fixtures that, that you may have installed. Or maybe they're not that old with the Colonials, maybe they're 20, 30 years. But, and we don't even try to factor in the maintenance savings that a lot of those are just gonna fall apart um, because they're, they're older. You know, they've been in, in their locations for quite a long time. So, I mean, I'm just, uh, just trying to put a little bit of uh, information here. Um, uh, let's say, hypothetically, it'll cost us a million dollars, which will be uh, three mils in tax increase. Um, uh, we don't 
there's no uh, guarantee that the cost of electricity will not go up, which will also be an increase, what will cut into our savings. Um, the breakdown of the materials possibly could happen all at the same time. So in that one particular year, if we were to have a substantial amount of light bulbs or, or fixtures blow out, now we're, now we're into a cost factor of replacing them, um, which will dip into whatever our, our annual savings would be, which would dip into our return on investment. So um, I, I don't know. I, I just see a lot of variables here um, that, I mean, you could be telling us in the long run we're going to save money up until a certain point then naturally we have, we're going to have repairs that we're going to have to go back in to take care of. And looking out 20 years, I mean, everything goes up in price. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what the cost of even of fixing this, a company coming out to fix this will be, unless you're guaranteeing us what the cost will be over the course of a 16-year of a period. Yeah, for that very low percentage of failures that you'll have in the, let's say, 15-year, 20-year time frame, uh, the the percentage uh, of that, yeah, I can't tell you exactly what the repair cost is, but I, I do want to say that that it is a very low uh, percentage that would be failing in that time frame because of the long life of the LEDs. But uh, I also do want to point out that if the energy rates go up, your actual your savings go up. So that that would be to your benefit because you would have you you have a cost structure like this right now, consuming so many watts. We're going to take it down to this. So if energy rates go up, this is a more vulnerable position in your current state. So the savings would be greater. And I just do want to mention one thing, one thing to kind of characterize this project. If you were a new township or a new development and you're installing lights, you're not installing, installing the old technology. LED really isn't a new technology. It's what's been installed, you know, for 10, 20 years in new developments. So we're just getting you up to the current state. It's just that you have a very old, like many municipalities, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure currently of your street lighting. So it, we're not, this isn't to some cutting edge technology, this is the standard technology. So uh, right now we're just uh, considering approving going into phase two where you will come back with a lot more analysis of the numbers. That's correct. And there's, there's no raising of any taxes that's required to get into phase two, correct? Uh, we already have $40,000 in the budget for getting into phase two, and that should cover the cost, right? There's 40000 budgeted under the capital plan, that's correct. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm not a municipal tax expert, but I, you do have to factor in the savings that are going to be generated because there's, unlike paving or something like that, there's a financial savings that you're getting that offsets project costs. And when we come to, <clears throat> when we come to phase three, at the end of phase two, when we come to phase, phase three, uh, will we have, have choices of whether we, is that when we make the choice about the single monitor, um, the ability to change the wattage, or the, not the wattage, but the brightness. Yeah, we design between the that, basic and the and the uh, network. We would you would decide that in phase two. We can still present multiple options to you at the end okay. of phase two at the design phase. But then when you decide to move into construction, you'd be selecting. You know, we're doing the base upgrade or we're doing the network controls. Yeah. So that's the decision point would be when you're deciding to go on to construction. Our, our proposal will continue to show you multiple options there. Very good. All right. I'd also like to say, we this is not even looking at the future. We're just trying to bring the system up to what is now current and what is being used across the nation that's current and, and uh, getting trying to get rid of the old system that we have just to be something that is on par with uh, everything else that's happening in building everywhere. Uh, I have another question, if I may. Mm -hmm. uh, I like the idea. I'm worried about the cost next year uh, tax-wise. I don't want to raise taxes for this if, if we can avoid that. If we, in budgetary time, we, t we go with your, your uh, phase two and we're looking at phase three, 
we're not obligated to do every single lay, right? We could do no. smaller portions if we no. could fit it in the budget better. Yeah, you, you could. We haven't had municipalities do that, but you absolutely could say, I'm going to do it over a two-year period or, you know, or you could just do the co cobra heads or you could just okay. do the colonials. All right, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions from the board? Yeah, I, just to uh, piggyback on what Kyle just said, it, how, how, how do we pay you? Do we pay you all in one lump sum, or do we pay it broken down over a period? I, I'm just looking to, <laughs> yeah. do you accept, accept installment payments? <laughs> yeah, in, in, uh, in phase two, which is the design phase, I'd be the only one working directly with you. So we basically bill at the end of the phase um, so close to the time when you're deciding whether you want to go to construction or not. So that would be sometime in the, you know, summer uh, time period. The, the vast majority of the costs um, occur during construction. And so whenever we start construction, the contractor may invoice you two or three times during the construction period. And then we stay on as the project manager, so there would be uh, our project management fees. All of that is baked into all the project costs that we showed you today. There's no, you know, future costs that we show you in phase two. All the components are already there and pre-negotiated in firm at a unit price level. But is there like some sort of holdback system? Do we pay as work is being done? Yeah. Or do we pay you all at once and wait for the work to be the, done? The contractor never bills more than he's installed and there's 5% uh, retainage held out okay. on the entire project until uh, we're done with construction. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have one more question, but uh, do, 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 do. okay. If it comes back, <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, so at this point, I'd like to entertain a motion. If if someone would like to make a motion to uh, proceed with the d design phase for the. Streetlight procurement program. I'll make that motion. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. A motion and a second. Uh, at this time, I would uh, open it up to the um, public if they have uh, some comments. Just make your way to the podium. I'll, I'll vamp while you do that. And please keep your comments brief if we can. So okay. we can, I don't know if there might be some other folks who want to talk as well. Sure. Uh, Frank McCarran, 42 Rittenhouse. Um, this is a tough one. Um, I, I certainly am in favor of doing this phase and getting more information. I think LED conversion at some point has got to happen. We've got old, old street lights we have are getting older. So I, I certainly would think more information is warranted. I'm, I'm not sold on phase three. Um, you know, the DVRPC put out a, a brochure, 120 page brochure in May, March of 2021. Um, and they gave as a case study Tredifferin count, Township. And they showed Tredifferin spending 710,000 of cost versus what we're spending 700,000. Mm -hmm. And their annual savings were 86,000 versus our 43. So their payback period was 6.9 years without financing, and ours is 16. And if you add financing, it's basically, there is no payback. Um, and I assume this doesn't include those fancy controllers, which don't have savings. They just, they have, they have some savings. If you look at their reports, it's mostly costs. So I, I think this, in theory, if it's break even over 20 years, and it's good for the environment, then it makes sense just on that to do it. But I, I don't know, because I haven't seen these reports, is it because we have all this decorative lighting and it's so much more expensive than, some, than regular lighting? Should we be looking at getting rid of decorative lighting and putting in regular lighting if it saves money? Um, you mentioned Middletown Township. Um, we, we can talk to them, we can talk to their township manager in this intervening time and get some information. But, you know, they, they had said that their, 
they're, they were spending a million three and getting savings of a million two with an 11 year, 11 year uh, break even point. So I don't know whether or not ours is so much worse because we have much more decorative lighting or it's because costs have generally gone up. Um, I, I, would, I would say go ahead and do this and try to use this intervening time to get as smart as we can and see, and see if there are other options to try to have some cost savings. Um, I'm, I'm, I think LED lighting is great. I think it's brighter. I think it's better. Um, but, and, and, I'm, and I'm generally in favor of this round. I just, I just think there's a lot of work to do um, before we make a decision on actually pulling the trigger on the, on the whole project. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none, um, I'll call the question. All those in favor of proceeding to the design phase of the streetlight procurement program say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Okay. We'll Thanks. I look forward to working with you. And we'll see you again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That brings us to our first round of public comment. Uh, anyone in attendance who would like to give public comment, please come to the microphone, state your name and uh, where, you, where you live in the township. And Good evening. I'm, I'm Terry Christensen. I live at 6-7 uh, Kirkwood Drive in the township. Um, today is my 71st birthday. So what that means, among other things, is that I'm part of the fastest growing demographic in this area. Our 2009 comprehensive plan talked about our aging population. The most recent comprehensive plan talked about our, most, our rapidly aging population. The research we did at Friends Village says that within between 2010 and 2020, the number of people aged 65 or older in Bucks County jumped by 86%. My concern is that we are not being proactive enough in serving that population. Uh, and I have a couple of things I'd, I'd like to the board to consider over time. I don't expect any decision uh, in the immediate future. One is, as we move forward with different projects like the village overlay, I'd like us to keep an age-friendly mindset uh, in, in, as part of our deliberations. Age-friendly doesn't mean it's just age-friendly for seniors. Um, it means it's age-friendly for families. It's age-friendly for everybody. That means walk broader path, walkways. That means placing benches here and there. Um, also, hopefully, there is uh, an increase. Our public transportation becomes more robust. The other thing I would suggest is we should consider doing what the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has done, the city of Philadelphia, and other municipalities. I, I could list a bunch of them, but I, if I had a better, uh, if I had my computer in front of me, but we should consider forming a commission, a municipal commission on aging that specifically looks at, at these projects. And you could have a liaison to the Planning Commission, have a liaison to other committees. I understand it's difficult to get uh, people to serve on committees. That's, that's been a problem. I believe that this is a, a trenchant enough issue for people my age that it wouldn't be that difficult to recruit people. Um, and I would certainly do everything I could uh, in those regards. So I'd... Um, Moving forward, I'd ask you to keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm right there with you. I need a bench. Uh, okay. Any other public comments on items not on the agenda? Okay, uh, we have reports of boards and committees. 
and commissions. Uh, Peggy Driscoll is here for the Planning Commission. Hi, good evening. Peggy Driscoll, Chair of the Township Planning Commission, here to give a report on our April 18th meeting. Uh, the Planning Commission reviewed two Zoning Hearing Board applications and a draft of a new JMZO amendment for an overlay in the LIOLI Zoning District. Uh, first, we had Newtown Shopping Center, 3 West Road, uh, the Blue Point Grill. The applicant is seeking relief to increase impervious surface by 0.10% in the PC Plain Commercial District to build a 976-square-foot outdoor paver patio. The applicant briefly discussed the changes in seating by enlarging the patio. We recognize that the increased seating will also possibly impact traffic and parking, but this would be addressed at conditional use hearing. The commission recommends that the Board of Supervisors not oppose this de minimis increase in impervious surface. Uh, next, we had DeLuca at 7, 70 Twining Bridge Road. Uh, the applicants are seeking to subdivide a 3.08 acre parcel into two lots for single family homes. The existing buildings on the property are to be demolished. And other needed variances include relief of minimum lit lot width, setbacks, and building envelope size. Attorney Joe Blackburn discussed the past history of the parcel, which has been a subject of the zoning, hear zoning hearing a few years ago. The members primarily had concerns about the possible historic significance of the buildings. Deteriorated. Uh, they did acknowledge <coughs> that the condition of the farmhouse, the rental apartment, and the barn is very deteriorated, but will want input from the Joint Historic Commission before any decisions on demolition or preservation are made. The members voted 6 to 3 to recommend that the board not oppose the Zoning Hearing Board application. Those opposed to the application cited the need to uphold uphold the Joint Comprehensive Plan's goals of preserving the character of the CM Zoning District, our historic assets, and our open space. Next, we had a discussion in the Overlay District. Uh, the Bucks County Planning Commission members Jeremy Stolf and Lisa Wolf were in attendance to discuss their draft for an Overlay District in our current business commons. We're looking for ways to revitalize the commons to both preserve the business office district and address the recent changes in the business environment where workers are increasingly working from home. The Bucks County Planning Commission examined introducing residential uses and expanding permitted business uses in an overlay that would keep the residential uses internal to the commons. The draft ordinance addresses size of the residential buildings, setbacks, and other requirements, including outdoor amenities and commercial uses within the residential structures, a mixed use. The commons currently has a maximum building height of 50 feet, which could accommodate five stories. So we discussed a ratio called floor area, area ratio, they call it FAR, to help us better control the number of units per building. We ask that the ordinance be revised to strictly limit the height to 50 feet on residential uses so the towers, mechanicals, parapets, etc., are included in the 50 feet. We discussed the requirement of providing 5% public space, which would include pocket parks, benches, and outdoor eating areas. We were in agreement that some kind of uniform guidelines and design standards might be needed for these amenities. We are optimistic that we will be able to add some residential uses to the commons to help us attract and retain younger residents to the area. The Bucks County Planning Commission will return with a revised draft at some point over the summer, as our schedule permits. And that was all we had. Thank Any you. questions? Uh, I have a question. Uh, with the residential mixed use, you're talking about new buildings, not buildings that are already there that would be converted to apartment buildings. And well, you know, when we first started reviewing this, our goal was to retro retrofit or infill existing buildings. I don't think new construction was really at the top of the list even though we did discuss it. Um, I think our main goal is to revitalize the commons and add some uses um, for the workers that are there um, to kind of create an area where they don't have to leave the commons, maybe some restaurant uses, um, services, things like that. But um, you're saying that 
I mean, they showed a lot of images of new buildings, uh, three-story buildings. We, you were talking a whole lot about that. I know. So there are no, the buildings that are currently there are more than three stories, or, and they don't look like residential buildings that were shown by the Bucks County Planning Commission. So I think they have a completely different idea. I, I agree, and we intend to speak to them at our next meeting. I'll probably speak to them before our next meeting. I mean, our goal with the overlay was to retrofit and infill existing buildings in the commons and to allow more service, services to the tenants in there. Right, and but adding more residential use and apartment buildings, there's other proposals that have come our way uh, adding uh, apartments and attracting uh, younger people. And we just heard from Mr. Christensen about what, what can we do for older people. And I don't know if that impacts the business commons. You're talking about, um, sounds like you're talking about housing for current workers who are currently working there. Um, is that how I don't think we can zero it? in on who exactly would be there. I think our general feeling was um, existing buildings, um, you know, retail or offices on the first floor and maybe residential on one or two floors above. I don't think creating new buildings in there was on the... I don't think that's what we felt at the beginning we wanted to do in the Bucks County Planning Commission. I mean, we're not looking to put something in there like... Uh, a promenade. Well, that's what the Bucks County Planning Commission placed before you in terms of its imagery, which really, you know, looked more exciting than uh, converting an office building with apartments on the second and third floors. I mean, you, you, they were talking about alleyways, offsets, and things like that relating to new buildings. They weren't talking about retrofitting uh, office buildings. I understand that. I think we kind of got off course a little bit there. I mean, the three, you know, uh, Dennis, you, Ellen. You, you did spend a lot of time going back and forth about setbacks and amenities and this. So the in the in the the, the far the the area floor area ratio. I mean, you, you spent a lot of time on that, so I'm, I'm really kind of interested to see what they're going to come back with, because you did give them some a lot to think about. We did. We, I, I, I think uh, we had a lot of discussion. I don't know if they understand that we're not looking to develop a so-called promenade in there. We want to, you know, our goal is to retrofit and infill. And bring some people in who then can maybe work in the business commons as well. And, and maybe do some recreation, maybe get some meals. Right, right, absolutely. So I, we're going to speak to the Planning Commission, the Bucks County Planning Commission, and I, I think they're going a little off course from where we want to go. All right, thank you. Any yeah. other questions? I just, I don't see anybody that's developing apartments wanting to take the existing blueprint of what's in the business commons and using those buildings for that. I mean, they're obviously going to have to change that to make it appealing uh, for residences. Uh, you know what I mean? So yeah. is that part of what we're talking about, is uh, if they need to take down those uh, some of those warehouse-type buildings and put up uh, something residential that's uh, not dense? we would be okay with that or? I think that's something that we need to discuss. I mean, we have retrofitted some buildings where the pizza place is. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was, I believe, a warehouse at one point. Curtis Wright was a warehouse that they switched yeah. over to offices. And so we can't, we have control over what goes on in there. And I think we, we need a lot more discussion with the Bucks County Planning Commission and kind of direct them to where our vision is, but you know, it is possible. It is possible to retrofit those buildings. Are we dependent upon them uh, for you know direction, or are they dependent upon us for direction? You know, to tell them where to go. I. Hopefully, it's us trying to tell them what we want, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we we pay them for their services, so right. they they're uh, they're paid to do, I guess, what we direct them to do. Thank you. Yes. But um, I don't have it in front of me, the overlay that they presented, 
Uh, there were the pink areas, which is where they're anticipating these new uses. And if, I may be incorrect, but not a lot of it overlays these office buildings. It's more in the uh, vacant areas uh, across Penn's Trail, for example, uh, and uh, other areas that currently, you know, are underutilized in terms of buildings. So I think they have a completely different idea of uh, how they want to design this or recommend to us anyway. So I agree. We have a lot, we have a lot more work to do. I think uh, at the last meeting, like I said, you were all there, and it just got, it got a little off the path of where we wanted to go, and uh, a few of the members of planning, we've discussed that. So um, there are, I mean, we don't know also where the owners of the buildings, what their plans are. Would they be willing to add residential to their buildings? Well, could we somehow incentivize it? Yes. I guess that's I, possible. But, but uh, uh, I agree, we have much work to do yet. Yes, we do. Anyone else for questions for? Yeah, Eddie? just just a couple quick ones. Thank you, um, I'm sure uh, a lot of developers do beautiful retrofitting of, of I mean, we see different lofts that have been done in mm -hmm. some of these warehouses that are converted into mm -hmm. condos and things like that. But I mean, there's no um, ruling out of a tear down and a rebuild. I mean, is provided they do it with the aesthetics that we want in regards to what is there now. Not that we want them to build a warehouse, but making it look similar to what's in the commons today. Yeah, that could be a possibility, yes. Okay. Was there any um, discussion about the percentage of residential to business? It's like how we have a percentage of how many <clears throat> restaurants can be open in the uh, village of Newtown? Not really. We haven't gotten that far yet. Okay. So, I mean, but it, there's... We have I, a lot of discussion yet to go through. With. Okay. But I mean, has it been discussed of, of like all... 100% residential? Or no. I think, okay. No, no. So there will be a split in, in regard. I, I know there's a lot to talk about, but uh -huh. that's the the plan is to split between business and... Well, maybe not split, but to enhance maybe the buildings with, uh, a, a, you know, maybe four or five, six apartments on top of an existing building that has either a service business in it or an office building. Got you. Because, I mean, I think we still want to entice business to come. Absolutely. To I mean, uh, there's no manufacturing hardly anymore, but, but in, to entice like a, uh, a Merrill Lynch to come with their employees here. And if we have an attractive residential, I mean, that looking that the township can make both EIT tax from the people coming to work there and also from them living there and supporting businesses within the township, so. Right, uh, I mean, we, we, we can't, I think we more want the residential to complement what is already existing in the commons. And we also feel that adding some more services, uh, mm -hmm. maybe, you know, another restaurant or two, you know, a, a coffee shop, a, a, a barber shop, beauty shop, things like that. Understood, thank you. Okay. One other one other point uh, you mentioned a um, lot more people working at home. If you had this combination, where uh, a new business comes in and, and builds something with apartments above, their workers could still be working at home, <laughs> but True. in the same building, and they'll have it both ways, I guess. You know, a lot of the businesses are. I mean, a lot of the big corporations are calling back their employees at least four days a week. I know I read an article on, uh, online a couple of weeks ago that uh, there's one company in New York that said uh, they had some kind of, they were able to track their employees' computers and some employees hadn't opened up their computers in a month. So a, a lot of the big corporations, and I, if you notice in the, in the commons, uh, a lot of the parking lots are filled again. So we, we still have a lot more work to do. This is just the beginning. That's what we like to say. That's what we like to see, lots of 
cars in the business commons. Absolutely. Especially if they're from New Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any, anybody else? Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I just have a couple of things to count, uh, comment on as, as in, under my chairman's report. Uh, I attended the uh, drug take back last Saturday. Uh, I know that the officer on duty had uh, like four barrels of uh, medications that were brought back to be disposed of properly. I visited the Planning Commission, as uh, Mrs. Driscoll mentioned, uh, and I also um, uh, attended the Newtown Fire Association on Monday evening. Uh, I don't want to steal any of uh, Chief Forsyth's thunder, but uh, we do need volunteers. And I believe recently there was a mailing of postcards uh, that were sent out, and on that postcard they had a QR, QR um, logo. And uh, if you went on that, if you went on that QR code, it would send you to a volunteer opportunity to volunteer with the fire association. Um, the the other the other night on Monday they. Um, received four new members, but they lost two new members or two two older members. So um, they're they're in constant constant need of. It's a regional thing. It's a county thing. It's it's a statewide thing. It's probably a national thing that people aren't volunteering for uh, fire fire services, but it is something that we will pay for, one way or the other. If we don't have volunteers, we're going to have to pay additional staff. And um, so if anyone's out there, especially younger folks, uh, I know I've been going to those meetings for the last four, four or five years and, and realized that uh, it's something I could have done before I got physically unable to perform. Uh, so I just want to encourage folks to think about it. I gave, I gave the card that, that came to my house, I gave it to my daughter. So... All right, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Well, I didn't attend any meetings, uh, but I will uh, tomorrow attend the Bucks County Tax Collection Committee, and I'd like to talk more about that on the new business, if that's all right. Or I could talk about it now, but I think right, let's do new business. Thank you. Uh, I also attended the Planning Commission meeting and the Newtown Fire Association meeting. But what one thing that happened on Saturday night, which was Earth Day evening, um, the New Newtown Township EAC Environmental Group and Newtown Borough got together to present a forum with five extremely knowledgeable people in their fields, including Ferran Savage from Penn Environment, and single-use plastics, Alyssa Sarkovsky from Ecosystems about reusable plastics, Bowman's Wildflower Preserve uh, about pollinators and native plants, and the Bucks County Food Alliance about buying locally. It was very informative, very well done. The Newtown Theater, it was, as I said, at the Newtown Theater, and they presented six small movies before the panel uh, spoke and took questions. Uh, there was a full house, and it was a rousing success, and a plan was hatched to uh, repeat this every year. Uh, and I think it's a great thing and a great opportunity, and uh, just the job that was done was, it was so well put together, and I just want to thank everybody that was involved. I'm sorry, I missed it. Mr. Calabro, Mr. Davis. I have the uh, Park and Rec report for tonight. Uh, Pre-registered today for the following upcoming programs. Babysitting and Beyond, Junior Golf Clinic, Patriotic Wreath Workshop, and Intro to Dance. And also on other announcements, full day camp counselors, counselors age 17 and up, and volunteers age 15 and up are still needed. Reach out to the Park and Rec office for an application. 
2023 spring summer brochures should be mailed out to township households in the next two weeks. So look for those in your email. Uh, other item I have is on the community uh, service side. There's an organization, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, honors veterans and they, uh, they're doing a walk. They've done it last, like done it for several years. Um, they do a walk for the month of May across the country just to remind everybody Memorial Day is here and what it's about, uh, it, the true meaning of Memorial Day. So last year I walked it from the leg from Yardley to Newtown. Um, and I didn't like the greeting we got in Newtown. I thought we could do better. <laughs> So there's uh, flyers going around um, May 3rd, Wednesday, May 3rd at 5 p.m. at the Center of State and, uh, what's that, Washington? What's that main intersection? State, State Washington. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at that intersection, the walkers for the, the leg from Yardley to Newtown is going to be coming through that intersection and stopping at the Temperance House. So if anyone feels like they want to go out there, rah, rah, sis, boom, bah, you know, and uh, cheer on the walkers, um, you can do that. Just show up and, you know. And uh, give them give them a good greeting, a good Newtown greeting. So is that called uh, carry the carry load? the load? I sorry, I didn't say that the, the yeah. way it is carry the load. Yeah, the, they mentioned it at the fire association meeting. Yeah, as yeah, well. yeah. They I got, think they're putting they're a, have the ladder. Truck. Yeah, they're putting a ladder truck and flag out, um, and it should be pretty cool. Yeah. Thank you. That's May, all I have. May third. Yeah, Wednesday, May third, five p.m. Next next week. Mr. Calabro. I have nothing to report. Thank you, sir. Okay. That brings us to our reports of officials, and our engineer has no agenda items. Could I just... I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. I, I don't want to give you a hard time. <laughs> Please, I love but, it. But, you know, I'm getting ready for my cardiac rehab, and well, every day I walk the 100 yards from my house to Lower Burlington Road to see if any work is being done on the trail, and so far, not. Uh, do you have any update on that? Uh, the contractor is scheduled to begin next week. Good. I'll be walking back there, and I won't be bothering them, but i got to get my exercise in. I understand. I think there was um, one other question a resident had. Uh, what other projects are we looking at here? Um, sorry, I'm having a senior moment. No, it's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, overall time. projects, so we have the You're road program. Road. Um, kicking off we're working on contracts right now um so that's in the works we have to get our liquid fuels approval but soon you know you'll be seeing roads paved right okay yeah. thank you mm -hmm. Okay, Mrs. Solicitor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> First item on our report this evening is consideration of sending the comprehensive plan update uh, back to the jointure for distribution to neighboring municipalities and the school district and for advertising a public hearing to consider adoption. Uh, I'm sure the board knows the last uh, comprehensive plan update was 2009. They recommend that it be done every 10 years. Uh, we're at the 14-year mark. Uh, I think a lot of time has been spent by the Bucks County Planning Commission uh, and the uh, three uh, municipal planning commissions in reviewing and recommending that. Uh, but at this point, uh, it takes board action to authorize it to be sent back to the jointure uh, so that the requirements of the municipality's planning code that uh, neighboring municipalities and the school district get a 45-day opportunity to review it and comment on it uh, can be fulfilled. Uh, so if the boards of a mind, it would be a motion to uh, send the comprehensive plan back uh, to the jointure. Do we have such a motion? I'll make that motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Have a motion and a second. I know it feels... Like we started rewriting this in 2019, where the when we had the 10-year mark, <laughs> uh, there have been a lot of meetings, uh, jointer meetings, and and uh, planning commission has reviewed uh, much of this, and we've come up with our own addendum, which is is being attached. Um, yeah, I, I think it's it's ready to ready to be uh, sent out to. The public and our neighboring, neighboring districts, municipalities, and school district. So, um, any qu any other questions or concerns from the board? Seeing none, I'll any any from the public. 
Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor of sending the comprehensive plan update back to the joint chair for distribution to neighboring communities in the school district and for advertising a public hearing to consider this adoption, uh, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Second item on our agenda is uh, considering enacting an ordinance amending the police pension plan to incorporate an IROP option. This is a housekeeping item in order to uh, meet the requirements of the collective bargaining agreement with the police uh, regarding their uh, police pension. At the last meeting, you authorized me to advertise it. It has been advertised. And if the boards of a mind, it will be a motion to enact uh, ordinance number 2023-0-3. I'll make the motion. I have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll uh, second. Okay. All right. So a motion and a second. Do we have any further discussion from the board? And, and again, I would just say this is uh, enacting the, the written, written ordinance that we uh, advertised f for this meeting last, last time. So, um, any any comments from the public? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor of enacting the ordinance amending the police pension plan, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the next item on our report is uh, consideration of trying to finalize the paperwork for uh, the settlement of litigation involving Brookshire Phase 2. Uh, this is actually only a, uh, there's only one lot associated uh, with this development in Newtown. However, uh, when it was being developed, the developer uh, adversely impacted uh, two uh, Newtown residents' driveways, and uh, we wanted to uh, have that uh, repaired uh, for those residents. Uh, we ultimately drew down um, the money, and well, we didn't draw it down, we settled with them, and they paid us the money to have that work done, and that work is uh, nearing completion, but there was a lot of administrative paperwork that we had to do as part of uh, the settlement, um, namely putting into effect all of the requirements of the final plan. And there were certain parcels on that plan, there were road rights of way that had to be accepted into dedication by the township. There was uh, roads that were vacated by the township previously that had to be conveyed to the adjoining property owners. There were uh, sewer easements and there were open space parcels. I have prepared all of the uh, paperwork uh, for that, and uh, I would ask the board for a motion to adopt a resolution accepting dedication of the public improvements in Brookshire Phase 2 and authorizing uh, the required conveyances pursuant to the final plan of Brookshire Phase 2. I'll make the motion. I have a motion to have a second. I'll second it. I have a motion and a second. Do we have any uh, questions for the solicitor? Any co conversation from the board? Any comments from the public? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor of adopting this resolution, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Final uh, item is consideration of the two zoning hearing board applications that you heard um, Mrs. Driscoll um, you know, provide a, a recap on to the board. Uh, does the board wish to take uh, a position on either of those applications? Um, I am not in favor of approving the two houses on 70 um, Twining Bridge Road because this is a conservation management district which uh, specifies one uh, home per three acres and this is two homes per three acres and I think uh, I heard from uh, local residents at least one local resident who has purchased the house on three acres and was told he could never you know add another divide up his property because of the conservation management and here we have an application where they want to do just that and um, I would make a motion that we at least send a letter opposing uh, this application on the basis of its in violation of the conservation management uh, zoning. 
I'll second that motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, all right. Um, I would say that I, I would not want to send the send a letter or, or, or send the solicitor. Um, I'm aware from talking to some of the neighbors that they're okay with two houses. Um, when it when it comes to when it comes to demolition, that, that, that's something we can talk about in the future. Whether we want to have an inspection and see if there's any, if there's any historical value to the property, um, but that's something that I believe would come when, when in land development we'd have to authorize a demolition. Uh, so leave it open to others here. I am more concerned with upholding our zoning. That's the main issue I have. I concur. I, I see nothing wrong with uh, a letter being sent, provided Mr. Sandler doesn't charge us per letter. Uh, <laughs> no, just by word, Mr. By Clark. word? Okay. Yeah, okay. word, please. No, I, 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 I think that would be a, a good thing to do is uh, send a letter in defense of the township. Correct? To keep the zoning. Yeah. Okay. I hear you. Uh, okay. Uh, so we've uh, had comments from the board. Do we have comments from the public? You're welcome on this issue. Yep. Yes, my name is John McIntyre. Please. My name is John McIntyre. I live at 74 Twining Bridge. And I really would like if the board would oppose this changing uh, when I bought my property 36 years ago, I guess it was, I came to the township down in the other building there. I don't remember the gentleman I spoke to, but I asked him about the possibilities of those plots. There were three of them if they could be subdivided at a later date. And he pretty much flat out told me, no, that would never happen. And that was the main reason I bought mine, because we bought that because we wanted the space around us and the other properties that have space around I, I'm along with most of the other people. We would like to see that place cleaned up because it's, a, it's, it's just an eyesore. Yeah. But I don't see a need to have to change the zoning in order to make that happen. If they put one house on there, it'll change the whole appearance of the corner. You don't need to put two. My wife and I will be the ones that will take the blunt of all the work that gets done there because I border that property on two sides. And looking out my front windows, it's not going to be a pleasant thing to be looking at these backyards. You never know what's going back there. There's going to be swimming pools, toys, sheds, and God knows what else. And the other thing that concerns me is once you houses go in there, you got driveways, sidewalks, and all that. Now you're adding more impervious surface, and all the water comes downhill to me. So I really would like to see it just stay as conservation management, one house. So I, I just ask if you possibly, you know, oppose the changing the zoning on there. Well, it just just a point of clarification, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Mr. Yes. The, the request is not to change the zoning. The zoning will remain well, CM. The request is to build two homes where you're only allowed well, one. Right. So the remainder of the zoning will remain CM. Right. So I just want you to understand that. It's the setbacks and right. things like I, that. I understand that, right. yeah. Right. So by sending a letter, we are opposing it and letting the zoning hearing board decide Obviously, it's their decision, but we are sending a letter to oppose it. And you made a point about, well, these houses come in, uh, and there's on the plan, there's no uh, swimming pool, there's no decks, and other things that uh, homeowners will come to the zoning hearing board afterwards and want a variance or right. to, to do that. And like you said, it's going to even make a, the, a bad situation worse. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, come on.
Hi, I'm Mike Ewald, uh, John's neighbor. So when we bought this property, we did, it's called due diligence. Conservation management is one house per three acres. Him and I both adhered to that. You know what we just went through with Toll Brothers? What happens if this guy proposing 88 Twining Bridge gets it changed? What's Toll going to say when we denied that and you denied it? I think it could be a possible lawsuit on Toll's part. Be very careful with it. I agree it is an eyesore, but it's still conservation management. Thank you. I guess I'm going to third that motion. Um, look, we, you spent a lot of time fighting Toll Brothers to maintain the rural character of that road for that section, right? You wouldn't let them build entrances onto Twining Bridge, try to keep it, maintain the character. I can understand it's an old dumpy thing, and yeah, why not knock it down and have two nice houses and more EIT because it's two houses, not one. But it's a slippery slope. You do that, then someone else comes. No offense, but you guys are old. You know, somebody buys their houses, knock them down, put two more, and before you know it, it's it's it, it's just going to be completely that way. So I just think you just hold the line right now if you can. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. McCann. Any other comments? All right. Uh, seeing none, hearing none, uh, call the question. Those in favor of sending a letter to the Zoning Hearing Board um, with our views, uh, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay. One opposed. One opposed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do want to note that um, all of the folks who spoke tonight would be encouraged to attend the Zoning Hearing Board hearing, where the decision is really being made, yes. and let them know how you feel, because let them being the Zoning Hearing Board members, because that's where you're, you're going to try to accomplish your your goal in your opposition to this. Can I ask a, a procedural question? Sure. When you're at the Zoning Hearing Board, a resident is not a party to the case, and they usually don't want to hear from residents at the Zoning Hearing Board, and I, I'm thinking until after they make their decision. Or well, they can't make a decision before they hear from the public. They okay. must ask for public comment before they make a decision. Right. That That's usually comes after all of the testimony right. All right. is done. That's uh, what I wanted to clarify. So they will, be, they will open it up to public comment. Plus, if you're, you seem to be adjacent neighbors, you could become parties to that, and you can call your own witnesses. You can cross-examine the witnesses of the applicant, uh, and you can appeal a decision that you don't like. Uh, so that's what party status is all about. You may want to avail yourself uh, of that if you're immediate uh, or, or, or close-by neighbors of this uh, proposed uh, two homes. And usually the Zoning Hearing Board would ask if there's anybody that wishes to be a party to it. Yes. Right at the meeting, they'll ask that question. They, they should, and if they don't, before they get started asking the applicant's attorney to begin his case, you should stand up and say, I'd like to become a party to this, and I know what that means. And if you want to, I'm not saying it, if you want to. It would just give you an opportunity if you wanted to call any of your neighbors as witnesses. If you wanted to testify, you'll, you'll be able to make a statement. But if you want to testify yourself during the hearing proper, if you want to um, cross-examine the applicant's witnesses, ask the applicant's witnesses uh, questions, you can't do that if you're not a party. So suggestion, not saying it has to be done, but suggestion. And you don't have to have legal representation to do that. That's correct. But there's nothing to stop them from making public comment. Correct. Okay. You don't have to be a party to Make speak after all the testimony is done. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That concludes our report. Very good. Uh, Mr. Manager, 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General fund balance this evening is $5,057,190. <coughs> Plan expiration is before the board with no action required. We have Chief Forsyth here this evening to give a monthly ESD report. Good evening, Chief. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. And, Chief, if I got anything wrong in what I said, you can correct me. No, everything you said was correct. I can give you the exact number. It was 7,361 postcards sent out. To date, we have six hits on the uh, UR code. So six people are interested out of 7,361. 7, so we are in desperate need, as Mr. Fisher said, of, of volunteers, and it's not looking good. So we're trying everything possible, and we'll continue to try and see what we can do. Yep. The March report for NFA and emergency services, we responded to 135 calls for service. Emergency services completed 49 fire safety inspections in Newtown Township and 53 in Newtown Borough. We also conducted five use and occupancy inspections along with the codes department. Out of the 135 calls for service, we responded to 67 EMS calls, 42 alarms, five assist the squad, two dwelling fires, two wires calls, three building fires, one auto extrication, seven traffic accidents, one dumpster fire, one fumes call, one brush fire, and one outbuilding. Um, everyone's aware that on April 1st, we had, in, as long as I've been here, our first tornado that did considerable damage to the township. Um, we worked well with the police department to get everything under control. The next day on Sunday, April 2nd, we spent the day with the National Weather Service where they made the determination that it was a tornado. Um, so that was a lot of work for them for that weekend that we had to storm. Uh, we conducted in April two live burns for the volunteers and the career staff. A live burn is where we're required to do one a year. We had to go to the training center. Um, horrible thing to say, but we set fires, we put them out, we keep setting fires. Uh, both days we did eight evolutions, so in, the la in this month we completed 16 evolutions of live burns. Uh, this is good for the fire department because we don't see a lot of major fires. The training center at Lower Bucks, we can do commercial fires and residential fires. Uh, we have another one coming up in October. I would like to invite all of you to attend to see what we do as far as our live burns go. Um, maybe if you're interested, a lot of gray hair up there, I understand that, but we can pack you up and send you inside. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is I'd like to thank the board for their contribution towards the Fire Association for the $75,000 towards the SCBA. Um, it's an extreme help to us um, with everything the township does, with the, with the contribution and the emergency services department. It's something that we have to go through every 15 years because the packs that we wear will not recertify after 15 years. So it's a it's an expense that we try to prepare for every 15 years, but unfortunately other things get in the way and and we have to reach out for more help. Um, March we did apply for the safer grant. We applied for four firefighters. Hopefully, keep your fingers crossed, we're successful this year. I think with the budget changes we made with hiring Assistant Chief Weaver, I, I'm hopeful that that will make an impact on the, the, the peer group that, that looks at the grants and we get further and are successful in obtaining the grant. So that is my report for March. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Chief, I was asking my neighbors, I live in Windermere, Raintree, about the postcards, and I don't know anybody there that has received one. And we have a lot of younger uh, families there. They're either young or they're old, like me. Um, so I was wondering do, if, if they came there, because uh, everybody I talked to on my street, nobody received it. I will double check with the post office, but they we use the same list that we send out our uh, donation letter for. 
So I'm sure a lot of people, a lot of people donate to the fire association. So you do not? No. Okay, I'll, ch I'll check and see. I can give you an application if you'd like one. So uh, anybody at home, um, it, it's, it's getting to a serious situation with us. Uh, we are averaging seven people per call. Um, if we try to keep up to the NFA's, NFPA standards, um, we are nowhere close to their standards. We're running three pieces of apparatus. Currently, this building across the street, we have four active firefighters running out of it. So when the career staff is not there, we are pushing uh, extremely hard to get a truck on the street. And most of the time after 6 p.m., uh, it's myself or someone else driving it. So uh, we are in desperate need. I know um, Newtown Grand is the biggest and the best. If we can get 10 people out of there to join Station 55, we would be in, in heaven. So if you're out there, you're listening, we'll be more than happy to train you. We'll give you the equipment to do it and we'll make sure you're the best you can be. So, but I will definitely check into that tomorrow. Yeah. And Chief, on, yeah, go ahead. Oh, Chief, just on another topic. Um, I, I know in the past we used to bleed the fire hydrants. Yes. Do we still do that? And, and if so, is there a time? The water department, I think, just concluded that. Oh, okay. All they right. usually do that in March, early April, the okay. end of March, beginning of April. Oh, okay. I, I was just wondering if neighborhoods should know that they're bleeding. Yeah, I, I think they're all done. To the best oh, of my right. knowledge, okay. they're all done. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Have a good night. You, you too. All right, Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Chairman. I have two other items under our report for the board's consideration. Uh, first of which is the uh, consideration to approve an interim bill pay resolution. We had uh, worked with the solicitor uh, after reviewing several other uh, resolutions from other towns that <clears throat> will allow um, the township to pay fees in between cycles of, of um, board meetings, prim primarily just to be able to, to pay our vendors uh, and so that we inc don't incur late fees with, with uh, our vendors as well. Uh, so the appropriate motion would be a uh, motion to approve the interim pay bill pay resolution. Sorry. Do we have such a motion? So moved. Do we have a second? I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion from the board? Uh, I did have... I, I think you answered one of my questions. If other um, municipalities have uh, done this, yes. And uh, is there any that you can name? Or? Off the top of my head, I think it was up. There was Upper Salkin that we pulled one from. Um, I believe one was was Middletown as well. Uh, we always like to follow Millet Middletown's lead. They seem to be leading in a lot of things, like LED lighting and so on. Uh, you had a. a Exhibit A, where you listed a, a bunch of uh, things, uh, invoices that might be handled this way. And I'm a, a little bit surprised about um, parks and recreation program third party instructors. These people are charging us late fees? No, they are not charging late <laughs> fees. But they, so with our park and rec programs, we have a lot of. I like to call them mom and pop shops. They're small businesses. And if we get into the summer months and we start canceling the second meetings of the month, they go for over a month without being paid. Well, and, and again, they're, they're local right. people. Mostly pops. residents. Okay, I feel sorry for them and uh, they should get paid, but you know, if people, if companies are gonna start charging us late fees for being a month late, then they don't understand how uh, municipalities work, and you know maybe we could find competitors that won't do that. I don't know, but I'm not I'm not opposed to this. I'm just making a statement. I know a question also. Okay, uh, are, are we going to be keeping track on which payments went out this through this method, or yes. is all going to be tracked? No, it'll all be documented. Right. I think you've got to ratify them. Yep. At your next meeting. Got you. All right, thank you. I, I, well, I understand that, but I don't want to make thrown in with the rest of the bills. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. No, they'll, they'll be separated yeah, which, out. Which. Okay, thank you. 
<clears throat> the next agenda item we I, might have an impact on that if we uh, forget uh, if we get the new software there might be a way to create a column to make sure that, it, that those are identified that we the ratifications as opposed to bill payments so that was my thought I'm sorry I have a question for the uh, solicitor in regards to um, how do we not violate the sunshine law and how how because these votes have to be made in public correct correct so how do we do the interim and then do we do something in public yes can you explain the procedure sure how would, how would it go you you're by this resolution you would give authorization to pay these <clears throat> interim bills at your next available meeting the meeting that's following the payment of these bills on your agenda will be an item to ratify the payment of those bills and that vote will come before you as a public vote but but the in the interim how do we give permission to pay those bills you you don't the the township manager or his or her designee has that authority by the passage of this resolution okay so we will not know until after the fact Correct. Although I would suggest that the township manager or the assistant manager may be able to advise you if and when that happens so you know that it's happening. Okay. Any other questions? Um, we have a motion and a second. Any, um, let me ask for public comment. Any public comment? Seeing none, I'll Call the question. All those in favor of approving the interim bill payment res resolution say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5 0. One final item under our report, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Finally, we have um, the, the information that we need to proceed with the new software for the, the codes and zoning department, along with uh, our finance departments. Um, <clears throat> Dallas Data Systems uh, is the vendor. Uh, for the purchase of a program called Cassell, um, <clears throat> which is a financial software that is eons above and beyond what we're operating with at the moment. Uh, they provided a <clears throat> uh, quote of $68,455. This money will be taken from the American Rescue Fund, and we had initially uh, allocated $100,000 under that fund for the purchase of this system. So the appropriate motion would be authorization to execute the agreement with Dallas Data Systems Incorporated for the purchase of the Cassell software in the amount of $68,455 from the American Rescue Fund. Do we have such a motion? I'll make that motion. We have a second? I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Any uh, further discussion with the board? And again, I'll, I'll just repeat it for emphasis that this was budgeted for $100,000. And it's um, 68, so there, there's a savings. Now, how does the annual upgrades support? It's, That'll be budgeted under professional services. And is there a, a time limit on that? How many years forward or just time ongoing? It, it, the duration of the contract? Yeah. It will, it'll renew annually until we terminate, if we ever terminate. Okay. Well, the last software we had for a long, long time, so. It looks it. <laughs> okay. Um, any comment from the public? Seeing, seeing none, um, call the question. All those in favor of executing the agreement with Dallas Data Software, Dallas Data Systems for the purchase of Cassell software, software from the ARPA fund, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. That's all I have under my report. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Chair. Mr. Lewis, I, I have one uh, question regarding the public works report that you probably can answer. Uh, it says that the Roberts Ridge playground equipment issue was caution taped off and reported to Megan Prusinski. What, what was that all about? There was some damage to the play structure. 
from uh, vandals? Vandalism, yes. And has that been taken care of? It's in the process, yes. Oh, that's too bad. Thank you. I just want to add to that that their vandals are damaging the trees in the park, Roberts Ridge Park, as well as the playground. So just an FYI. Okay. Okay. We're going to minutes, bills, and reports. Yes. I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes of the April 12th Board of Supervisors meeting. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any questions from the board? Any from the public? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor of accepting the minutes of April 12th, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0 like to make a motion to pay our bills in the amount of $396,772.96. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion with the board? Any from the public? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor of paying our bills as found in the April 26 bills list, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. I'm going to make a motion for uh, our inner fund transfers, which is going to be a very big number that I will ask the township manager to, to explain after uh, I say the number. So I'd like to make a motion for the total of inter fund transfers in the amount of seven million four hundred twenty one thousand two hundred and thirty three dollars and fifty five cents we have a motion do we have a second we have a motion and a second um would you like uh, to have some discussion the, so yeah. generally speaking most plainly speaking the, tr the transfer amount of that amount is from funds from TD Bank to a Pliggett account. What that's going to do is allow the township to collect additional revenues uh, on the interest because Pliggett offers a much higher return on investment. Thank you. Does that answer the question? It does. So we're getting out of TD Bank? Not totally, but yes. <laughs> okay. I know somebody's going to love that. Yeah. All right, so we have a motion, a second. We've had some discussion. Any further discussion from the board? Any from the public? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor of the interfund transfers as found on the bills, April 26, 2023 bills list, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. That brings us to our second round of inter of <laughs> <laughs> I wish there was a second round of interfund transfers. Uh, second round of public comment. Uh, please uh, come to the podium and state your name. And John D. April, Newtown Grant, biggest and the best. Um, now that you approved the uh, the idea for the um, LED street lights, it's about time that you stop the hypocritical thing about. Uh, Businesses having LED lights in the township. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. We'll move ahead. Uh, let me just get to my page here. Any old business? Any new business? Yes. A Who? Question. I have an item. Uh, uh, tomorrow, uh, there's going to be a meeting of the Bucks County Tax Collection Committee, and that's uh, what I'm supposed to be uh, a liaison with. And uh, obviously, uh, they are going to discuss uh, EIT, the Keystone Collection Group. We'll have a report on EIT. Uh, but uh, of interest is uh, a resolution to amend the 1932 Sterling Act, which prevents municipalities like us from collecting any EIT from uh, residents who work in Philadelphia. Anybody who's a resident and uh, works in Philadelphia 
not working at home here in township. If they work in the township but be employed by a Philadelphia employer, they should pay the new town EIT tax, which is much less than the wage tax that they would have to pay if they commuted to Philadelphia. But the resolution is uh, wording, uh, they want the state and the legislature to amend this uh, 1932 Sterling Act so that municipalities can get 1% of the wage taxes paid by uh, residents of the township, uh, uh, the, those wage taxes that they would pay to Philadelphia. Philadelphia would give us 1% back. That's the resolution, which I hope I can bring to, a, to the next meeting, I guess, of the Board of uh, Supervisors here to discuss that. And just for your information, there was some data submitted uh, regarding uh, wages. Uh, Newtown Township residents that, who are subject to the Philadelphia wage tax their total uh, wages are 60, over nearly $61 million. And I think they pay, I forget what it is in Philadelphia, 3.45% or something like that? Around 4%, whereas if they were working at home, they would only pay uh, the 1% here. So I got to uh, attend this meeting to learn all about the numbers and what that would actually mean for uh, Newtown. Thank you, Mr. Mack. I know that's been something that's been discussed many times since 1937 or whatever year 32. it was. 32. <laughs> but that would uh, be a good discussion. Any other new business? Uh, we had an executive Session? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'd uh, just like to announce for the record that the board met an executive session prior to this meeting uh, to discuss uh, litigation involving a Provco. All right. Seeing no objection, I will adjourn the meeting. Good night, everyone. Yeah.